Hello everyone, Kyle with Andrew Hilton here. Welcome to another one of our wonderful Wednesday afternoon beer tastings. Or now that it's actually dark outside at six, let's call them Wednesday evening beer tastings. Uh, we of course are covering a small part of Germany. Um, this is our Oktoberfest, but not serving any Oktoberfest beer because they're terrible Oktoberfest tasting. Uh, let's talk briefly about some of the German styles we're not going to be tasting. Uh, we are not going to be doing anything in a box style. Uh, we're not going to be doing anything in like a, uh, a smoked beer style uh, in the Bamberg, which uh, they smoke them over... Um, not beechwood, oak. I believe it's just oak chips. Uh, and then finally, we're not doing anything in a sour, so we're not doing anything like a uh, Berliner Weiss, and we're not doing a Kolsch. So we've talked a bit about what we're not doing, so let's talk about what we are doing. Hellas versus Pilsner explained. Well, we'll get to that in a second. We're not going to start with the Hellas, actually. We're going to start with the Hackershaw Keller. Uh, Aaron, would you be an absolute lamb and grab my glass from over there? I kind of forgot about that. It's been a bit of an afternoon. So, Keller beer literally means cellar beer, and this is from Franconia, which is a smaller part of Bavaria as a whole. Uh, cellar beer basically goes back to the very earliest days of lagering in which people would store the beer in their cellar at a cool temperature to allow the beer to finish fermenting and to well, what we'd now just call lagering. Now, because it had to be stored for a long period, it would be use a lot more hop than we traditionally see with a lot of the traditional German lagers like German Pils or German Helles. Uh, no map today. Um, I'll be honest, today's been a little bit of a, uh, a runaround um, as a uh, this morning, Devin and I forgot to actually order wines for a wine tasting for next week. So over the last half hour, what you haven't seen is that Aaron and I and Nigel ran around like crazy people trying to figure out what we actually had enough inventory of to hit one of the themes we talked about for our wine tasting for next week. So that was fun. Um, it's coming along beautifully. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so we're in Franconia, we're in Germany, and this is a style that I don't see very often. Now there is a secondary style called Zwickel. There's effectively no difference between the two. And you get that pretty hop note right off the top. Now of course there are several different styles of Pilsner as a whole. Uh, and I'm going to relate Keller beer quite closely to Pilsner here, uh, specifically against German Pils. Uh, within the various Pilsner families, uh, American Pils, German Pils, the new Italian Pils style, uh, and of course Czech Pils, German as a whole tends to have one of the lower hop levels. American pills tend to be very, very hop forward, and these are things like Victory's Prima pills. Um, for anybody you know here, uh, we have things like um, they call it a New Zealand pills. I'd call it a kind of an American style pills, and the part-time model. These are very, very bright, very hop forward, very kind of modern beers. Um, for any of you who remember back to our uh, SYC Pontificato Pilsner, um, that style has, uh, well done, Aaron, uh, that has some really, really uh, pretty earthy, chunky notes, but a little more perceptible bitterness than the traditional Czech pills. Uh, and then when we get back to traditional Czech pills, yes, there's a huge hop content, but they're not bright, showy, pretty hops. They don't have a ton of floral or fruit component. These tend to be very earthy, very spicy hops way down deep. German Pils, while it does have some hop to it, tends to be the lowest in terms of perceptible bitterness and also the lowest in terms of perceptible hoppiness. Uh, in fact, I would say some of your larger scale commercial pills, let's say Bitburger pills, doesn't have a lot of per perceptible hop to it at all. And one can kind of see how your American macro brews, your Budweiser's and your Molson Canadians and your Michelob's and that sort of thing kind of grew out of these German style Pilsners because they are so clean. But Keller beer is a little earlier than that. It also comes from Bavaria, which compared to like Munich or other places in Germany tends to make more flavorful beers. If you wanted to think of Keller beer as being the more flavorful Bavarian cousin of traditional German pills, you wouldn't be going too far wrong here. I will point out this comes from Hacker Shore. Um, we carry quite a few Bavarian breweries here in the store. Um, of course, we carry Erdinger, we have Schneider, uh, we have, you know, what variously claims to be the oldest brewery in the world in Vihenstefaner. Um, 
I don't know why I air quoted by hence the founder, which is unquestionably the name of the brewery and not oldest brewery in the world, which is what I meant to do. Um, but I really like Hacker style. I think the beers are very, very powerfully flavored. Uh, I think they're incredibly well priced. I like that they come in the tall cans. We've been carrying them for ooh, 15 years now. And I've always sold less Hacker than some of the bigger brands, especially Erdinger, but I've always liked them best. And I really appreciate that they actually make a Keller beer that's generally fresh and very true to style. If we're talking about other Keller beers out there in the world, um, I know Les Tours Miscuitaires out of Quebec, they make one, and I'm not sure I've ever seen another one in this market. Uh, how about you, Nigel? Keller beers in Alberta? Uh, there's one in BC, Persephone, they make one. Apparently Persephone Brewery makes a Keller beer. So they're not, they're not the most common style in the world. So I hope that we see more of them. I think they're very lovely, tasty lagers that have a lot going on with them. Creamore, uh, yeah, that's right, Kevin. Creamore did make a Keller beer. I don't know if I ever got a chance to try it. And let's be fair, Creamore Springs didn't stick around in Alberta very long because they got bought out by Molson in the very late 90s or early 2000s, and they tried to take them national, and it kind of never really took off. It didn't work for whatever reason. I, I think largely because Molson's salespeople weren't great at selling craft beer, partially why you don't see a lot of Granville these days. They're not good at selling craft beer. Hmm. Different malt compared to a pills. I would suspect not. Um, bit of background here. I really had planned to have uh, Mark Whitehead uh, here because some of these styles are not ones that I know desperately, desperately well. And I actually had talked to Mark Whitehead after our last beer tasting about doing this. And initially it said he absolutely could. Uh, and then uh, the weather started to get a little colder. So the, uh, the golf course where he actually does his day job, they were blowing out all of the sprinklers on the course today. So he couldn't join us in the end, which is unfortunate. But yeah, different pil malt. I would expect that this is mostly a traditional European Pilsner malt. Uh, and this is something interesting I was actually talking to uh, the guys at Establishment about is where you get your Pilsner malt from apparently really, really matters more than any other. Uh, so I was talking to the guys at Establishment and they were saying that, uh, especially for the, uh, the Mellow Gold here, um, they have tried making it with North American style Pilsner malts and it just, it wasn't working. Uh, and the same was true for uh, the part-time model in the Pilsner, uh, they have to use uh, continental Pilsner malts or else it just doesn't turn out. So yeah, a little bit of caramel taste. Now, I'm gonna just talk about this a little bit as a Pilsner, even though it isn't technically a Pilsner. When you're making styles of lager like this, you do tend to reduce a bit of caramel to them just because you wanna counteract that hoppy bitterness. The traditional Pilsner way you would do it in the very, very old days, and uh, actually there's one Pilsner, Tail Gunner Pilsner, uh, is still done this way. It's called decoction step mashing, where you gently warm up your mash, and you take a third or a quarter of the mash out, you bring that to a boil, you add that back to bring up the temperature of the mash. You take a third out again, boil that again, add that back to again raise the temperature. What you'll be doing with that is you'll also be caramelizing the sugars and adding this darker color. I will say this is a little darker color than a lot of Pilsners that I've had. And I do pick up some perceptible caramel in the nose. I can't say how they're doing this. My guess would be they'd be adding some caramel malt or some carapils to this. And yeah, very refreshing, nice and bitter, very interesting. And look at that, we're actually having some hoppy beers without having an IPA on the table. When was the last time we didn't have an IPA on the table? Oh, I remember the last time we didn't have an IPA on the table. It was when we did all the things stout. So bad luck, bad choice, never not doing an IPA again. Okay, so we'll move into the Mellow Gold. Now this is a Munich Hellas. We are sticking with a lager style of beer here. So um, a little bit of review for uh, those of you who aren't familiar. There are yeah, there are lots of different ways to make a beer. But in terms of yeast profile, you do have two broad overarching styles. You have ales and you have lagers. 
Ales are simpler to make. They are fermented warmer, such as you start at room temperature and they will slowly heat themselves up as they ferment. They will ferment very, very quickly, three to five days. Um, they tend to produce fruity, light, uh, and generally a little higher alcohol beers than, say, a lager would, but they do tend to have a very pronounced yeast flavor, especially as we get into things like Hefeweizen or any of the Belgian beers. With a lager, they tend to ferment at the very bottom of the tank, they ferment at much colder temperatures, and assuming you do a correct diacetyl rest, what you do get is a very muted yeast note. You get, effectively, you taste the hops and you taste the barley and you taste all the things except the yeast. The yeast is right at the background, you don't get any of that, you're just tasting the things on top. I can't think of a time where I've ever had a lager and said, oh wow, check out the yeast flavor on that. If you're getting that, they've made the lager badly. <laughs> Kubert style label. I, I can dig that, definitely a Kubert style label, that's fun. Ooh. So, fun story on this Munich Old Hellas, which I'm now realizing I probably should have done ahead of the Keller beer. Um, this is a beer that I almost passed on the first time. I, you know, we just started dealing with establishment a couple of months earlier. We were selling lots of stuff. They were like, oh, we're bringing it to Hellas. And I was like, oh, good. That no hop grainy thing that I generally find very boring. How wonderful. I can't wait to sell two four packs of it and then put the rest into the mixed four pack because no one will ever buy it. And then I brought it in. Uh, and immediately Nigel pointed out, Devin pointed out, Mike pointed out, this is amazing. This is one of the best lagers I've ever had. It's malty, it's rich, it's lightly sweet, it's crackery and biscuity. It's everything I could possibly want this to be. And I still wasn't convinced because, you know, it's a Hellas. Eventually, I did actually get around to trying it, and I was really impressed. I will also say this beer actually has a touch of hop to it on tap. At least it did when I was at establishment on Saturday. Um, but it smells exactly like, you know, oh, I'm already at low power mode. Oh, that's good. I'll definitely be able to read the comments to the end at this point. Um, <laughs> And if you've thought I've sit, hit a speed record on these in the past, apparently I'm going to have to hit one tonight just to keep the battery alive. So mm. this is a style that's very soft and nutty. And, and yeah, it just, it immediately, without so having, warm, yummy. yeah, it's so warm and yummy. It, it doesn't have sharpness. It doesn't have a, a ton of acidity. It doesn't have a lot of hop. It doesn't have sourness. It doesn't have a ton of roasted barley. It's not barrel aged. It doesn't have fruit in it. it it's just kind of a very simple beer and yet it immediately brings a smile to your face. It's got such wonderful construction behind it um, and yet it's so incredibly simple. I really like this style. Before I tasted it, it had like a bit of a, I couldn't really put my finger on the smell that I was getting. Like immediately it was like, it was like oil. It was you get like, oiliness. Like, like, a, like a crude oil not that severe but i mean yep. like they're just like kind of buzzed me a little bit and i don't get the same flavors on the nose like it's a it's a much different experience from like hmm. to your like to my taste buds anyways but well good uh good barley will have why is it so soft um that's a really interesting point this is why we lager if this was an ale you would get those yeast notes. Um, and when we get to Belgium next week and we get to that Unibrew Bon Chambly, we will have a very hard talk about yeast notes and at what level they are appropriate in a beer. Um, the reason this is so soft is that 90 day lagering process. Now, again, we're all used to lagers in the sense, hey, I got the quotes right in that time. Uh, we're all used to lagers in the sense of like a Canadian or a Kokanee or a Coors Light. Those are faux lagers. If, if those are really being cold lagered for 90 days under ideal conditions, I'll be shocked. That stuff gets cranked out at most in every two weeks. With this, they've taken a beer, they've made it very well, and then they've just let it very, very slowly cold age and lager over a very long period to gently soften the beer, to make it rounder, make it richer. You've got this absolutely stunning clarity, uh, and that clarity is down to the fact that the beer has a chance to completely settle. It's just hanging out for 90 days. It's not doing anything. It's just relaxing, clarifying, perfecting, becoming so soft. 
And yeah, I agree. Like, establishment really doesn't make a bad beer. Vacation will make a beer that doesn't sell. We'll get to that next week with the St. Truden. Um, but <laughs> yeah, um, I really don't think they've made a bad beer in my estimation. I'm trying to think if there's anything that establishments made that I really didn't love. I wasn't super sold on that hibiscus IPA, the 9 to 5. It was fine, you know, if it had come out from like, I don't know, Village, I'd say it's the best thing they'd ever made, but for establishment as an IPA, I thought it was a bit of a miss. Sure. That'd be about as close to a beer I didn't like from establishment. I'm going to look at their list. You know what, Chad, you're right. Um, the carb is soft. And I don't know if that's a deliberate thing. I've, I've never been to Munich, uh, unfortunately, but I don't know if that's a deliberate thing or not. I, I'll be honest, if I go into a brand new brewery for the very first time, I'm gonna order a full rail of every IPA they've got on tap, I'm probably just gonna leave the hell is there. And this is not a slight on establishment or the grand German brewing tradition of Munich, but a lot of craft breweries, they wanna have that Joe six pack beer. They want to have that beer that's just, I'm going to get some Bud Light drinkers in the door. Or if they come in with their friends who actually like good beer, they'll have something to drink with them. And very often they'll make just a very boring lager beer, but they'll call it their Hellas to make them feel more craft brewery ish when they should just call it their American lager. Um, and so I find that Hellas, especially on the craft beer side, there are some like establishment here that are really going all out to make a properly crafted, pardon me, properly crafted Hellas. But I've been to a lot of breweries and I've ordered a lot of the full sample rails where, you know, you try everything. Far more often than not, the hell is, is just, yep, this is our beer for Bud Light drinkers when they come in with their friends. And we're going to call it a hell is because it sounds better than like our lowest common denominator lager. And yeah, I think a lot of people have almost picked up the St. Truden and then not. It's an outstanding beer, and you'll see that next week. But yeah, it's been, a, it's been a bit of a tougher sell. And I think it's because right now, I don't know if people are really, other than sours, loving that big, hard yeast bite. I mean, I still have my Bavarian diehards. I still have people who buy, you know, Dunkles and Hefeweizens, like, by the case. I still have a few people who are really into the Trappists, but I'll be honest, like, people who are really clamoring for Belgian styles other than Mark. Hi, Mark. Um, he's always in for the Belgian styles. And, you know, I'll bring it in and Mark will buy it and then no one else will. Um, no, I find that, um, yeah, the, the beers that have a really, really prominent yeast note, they aren't as big as they used to be, and I hope that turns around. Oh, yeah, and Jamrock. I mean, what do you say about Jamrock? The winter sour seasonal that was so huge they had to keep brewing it full time because everybody kept buying it. Uh, same story as Ring Pop. Uh, although I think finally, maybe, Ring Pop sales might have slowed down just enough that we're going to start seeing it maybe get moved back into a seasonal? I don't know yet. I haven't heard any confirmation from that from uh, the folks at 88. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping maybe Ring Pop will move on and we'll get some other seasonals. Hmm. Oh, I do like this. Hmm. Okay. Let's jump on to the two big Bavarian styles, the ones that Everybody knows because these are the styles that you've been buying in the very distinctive 500 ml brown glass Bavarian beer bottle that effectively nothing else comes in from Schneider or Erdinger or Eyinger or Weihenstefaner or formerly Hacker or anyone. The Hefeweiss beer and the Dunkel. If we're being very correct, they're very often Dunkel Weissens in the sense that they also contain wheat. Now these are, and I'm not gonna get into the Einheitskabat, I'm not gonna dig deep into the Bavarian Purity Law of 1516. Um, a, because I don't really know it, I've never read the law all the way down. Uh, I know a fair bit about it, but it's also kind of dry and boring. 
and it set back brewing in Germany a very long way. And I mean, as much as people, you know, quote, oh, the Bavarian purity law of 15, 16, well, that's, that's the end all be all. Well, it really set back a lot of the local styles in other parts of Germany, like the salted sours of um, or the Gozas. Um, they really set back some other styles, and it really did put a very Bavarian twist on all of German brewing, honestly to the detriment of German brewing as a whole. Um, one of the big differences between like Belgian-style wit beer and Bavarian Hefeweizen is that German wheat beers, well, Bavarian wheat beers, don't have coriander because the Bavarians didn't use it, and under the 1516 law, no one could use it. But if you were over in Western Germany, near Belgium, before 1516, I'll bet a lot of those wheat beers did have coriander. They were a local style of wheat beer that was very closely related to the Belgians, would have had influences from the Bavarians. And post 1516, they just weren't allowed to use coriander anymore. So it just disappeared. So yeah, the 1516 beer laws are a little bit of a mixed blessing. I did say Ryan Hetzkebutt, I think. Aaron, quote me on that. Did I say Ryan Hetzkebutt? I think I did. Good question. Pretty sure I did. I'm somewhere else at the moment. That's fair. <laughs> All right. So this is the very either very aggressively carbonated or very badly poured uh, Hackershore Hefeweizen. Uh, Weiss, of course, means both white and wheat, uh, and Hefe means cloudy. Uh, these are naturally cloudy beers, partially from the protein. Wheat has a ton of protein to it, which is why your New England IPAs actually use some wheat malt, is to max out that protein. And also, it, they do not filter the beer basically at all. So when you crush wheat, uh, you get a ton of small particulate, flour effectively, uh, and that does contribute to the cloudy effect. They also have these gorgeous, like, fresh orange juice color that I always absolutely love with traditional German Hefeweizen. Now, if you've had a Belgian wit, you'll be very familiar with this aroma. You've got the banana, you've got the clove, you've got that really nice fresh cereal grain. You get a little bit of lemon, you get a little bit of orange. And those very, very delicate citrus notes has led to the terrible practice of adding citrus. And this is true in Germany too, adding citrus to your Hefeweizen. I get why you might want to do that. You know, it doesn't do anything for me. Uh, why does wheat beer create so much more foam than barley beer? I think that has to do with protein content. Um, when you look at um, some of the malts that people add to their beer, uh, carafoam particularly, in order to create a thicker, denser, more long-lasting head on their beer, those tend to be incredibly high protein malts and wheat at least the wheat that they use for Hefeweizen already has a ton of protein to it. I think it's just the fact that the wheat has the higher protein creates this thicker, longer lasting head. Melons. Ooh, not so much in the nose, but yeah, in the mouth. Like honeydew. Yeah. Persimmons. I do not, I do not know what that tastes like either. <laughs> Eric apparently eats a lot better fruit than we do. Yes. Kohlrabi. Kohlrabi's well, no. That, that was the obvious joke. I wasn't gonna, even gonna make that joke. Is most wheat beer unfiltered? Um, yes, actually in Germany they have a separate uh, beer classification for Hefeweizens that are run through a filter. It's called Kristallweizen. Um, the various wheat beers around the world, it varies. Um, I will say that when I first started drinking Big Rock Grasshopper, it looked a great deal like this. Uh, now Grasshopper, they actually, for a little while there, I don't know if they still are, they were actually putting the word Crystal Wisen on it uh, to cover up for the fact that they were putting all their cloudy Grasshopper uh, through a high pressure diatomaceous earth filter and not only stripping all the, uh, the cloudiness out, they are basically stripping all the flavor, which is why Grasshopper tragically, which was actually kind of a cool American style wheat beer, doesn't really taste like a whole hell of a lot anymore um, and why I really won't drink Grasshopper anymore. Um, I will say that one of the things that came out of the big, um, big rock expansion of ooh, what, 12-ish years ago? Um, they built this whole new craft side and they, they relaunched Magpie and they added a Dunkelweiss and they did all these great things. And then they also introduced like heavy diatomaceous earth filtration under high pressure to all of their core beers. 
and it stripped trad to tasting like Rickard's Red. It stripped Grasshopper down to tasting like not a lot. They took Warthog, which used to be like a really pretty, they used to use um, Pride of Ringwood yeast uh, to actually ferment that. It had a really pretty like British yeast character and they just went to standard Big Rock yeast on that. Yeah, um, Big Rock in the 80s apparently used to be exported to Portland because it was running with all the big early craft breweries on the American West Coast because it was just so good. And now, now I think we all know what it is. But yes, most wheat beer, good wheat beer, including like Rickard's White and Belgian Moon, is unfiltered. Um, we changed to, uh, actually I should say, um, my very first beer I ever actually got into, ever, and I was probably 1920, uh, was Big Rock Maybach. Um, um, I was 1920, not the year was 1920. Thank you, Aaron. Not, am I even older than you? Probably not. Um, anyway, Big Rock Maybach came out. It was their spring seasonal. It was sweet. It was malty. It had a nice hot bitterness to it. It was very fun. It was like 6.5. And when I'd barely been working here a year at this point. And the NS, oh, it was just our spring seasonal. So I bought like four or five flats of the stuff. <coughs> And this is when I first learned that hoppy beer doesn't age particularly well. And neither does, you know, and pasteurized beer in a lot of cases. I, ate, I drank that all winter. And by February, it was just getting nasty. It was absolutely foul. Uh, and my girlfriend at the time was so upset with me about how much of this beer was clogging up the garage and the fridge and everywhere. Um, but yeah, I, the first beer I ever got really geeky about was a Big Rock beer. Big Rock, it didn't have to happen that way. So, I've heard a lot of theories about this, and I don't have the absolute insider scoop on where things happen with Big Rock. I will say the, the story that I have heard repeated over and over and over again, it's the one that I come the closest to believing, is that about 1998, either Molson or Labatt closed their Calgary plant, and a whole bunch of people were laid off. And at about that same time, Big Rock's distillery manager was moving on. And when that plant closed, Big Rock took on a whole bunch of the senior staff from that Molson plant, including the person who ultimately became their brewery manager. And at that point, that was when they launched like AGD and AGD Light. A few years later, like the Bow Valley beers came along. That's kind of when things started moving in a more volume is better, let's maybe tone down the craft stuff, let's make Big Rock for everyone, which in the end kind of made it for not anyone because it's not crafty enough to run with the craft stuff and the people who are going to drink Bud Light are going to continue to drink Bud Light. Um, it was also when they were launched, um, does anybody remember the cold hard cash promotion? That this beer was called Cold with a K, and they ran this promotion called Cold Hard Cash, where the 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 winning cans were just filled with water, and there was this little like plastic cylinder inside with like a rolled up bill in it, and it was actual like money. Which how the hell did that pass food safety standards? So you've got a beer with a little cylinder in it with like a dirty dollar bill shoved inside, and you could get up to a hundred dollar bill in these things, um, and it was a huge promotion for them. And it's like how did that ever pass? Uh, but yeah, this this was kind of the big turning point for Big Rock uh, when they when they changed everything around like that. Uh, what's my favorite wheat beer? Um, this is an odd one. Um, I think when we did the 88 tasting with Jesse weeks and weeks and weeks ago, I talked about this. My favorite wheat beer in the store is 88 hologram wheat, which is funny because by a mile, uh, 88 hologram wheat is our slowest selling 88 beer. I've converted about four people in the city onto it, uh, and that's about it. Uh, I absolutely love it. It's to me the perfect American style wheat. It's got tons of really pretty wheat characters, it's got a little bit of hoppiness, it's got a big mouth filling character. It's just wonderful. Um, the other one I really, really like uh, is Three Floyd's Gumball Head uh, out of Wisconsin. Wisconsin? No. Uh, Chicago area, let's say that. Uh, Three Floyd's Gumball Head. 
It's a very, very heavily hopped wheat beer uh, that's absolutely outstanding. Yakima Valley. Yakima Valley. No, that's where the hops would be from. Cold did have the worst labels, <laughs> yes. And thank you, Kevin. You remember the two dots over the O, and I don't know what that's actually called. Aaron? Uber, no. Uh, Umlaut? Uh, no, that's something different. Anyway, uh, yes, cold with the two the dots. <laughs> the o. And yeah, they did have the worst labels. Like they, It was just a silver can with like really badly ripped off kokanee font that just said cold. It was pretty obvious what they were going for. Diuresis? <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. Okay, all right. Two dots placed over a letter. Usually a vowel. Hmm. <coughs> apparently it's a diuresis. I would also have said uh, umlaut, but apparently it's a diuresis. Or Aaron's just screwing with me because it sounds like diarrhea and he does things like that. <laughs> Diarrheas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hashtag mouthfeel. <laughs> is this a beer worthy of hashtag mouthfeel? No, I think th I think this is just a really classic style. I, would, I wouldn't go so far as to say hashtag mouthfeel. I'm not sure that's what that was about. But <laughs> White bark wood, yeah, driftwood. We you know we haven't done a driftwood beer on here yet. We really need to get like fat tug on here at some point. Oh well, yeah, fun. that'd be fun. Um, okay, so let's jump into what's coming next. And uh, for those of you who don't care what's coming next, give me a minute because we've got three things to talk about here. <coughs> So first up, let's talk about beer tasting in a week. So as I've already completely spoiled, we are going Belgium. And just like doing a French wine tasting, doing a Belgian beer tasting, there's no way you can do it justice in four beers, but screw it, I'm gonna try. So just like with the German, there's a whole bunch of styles like Berliner Weiss and Bamberg Smoke that we're skipping. Obviously, we're skipping a ton with Belgium, too. But we are going to cover Belgian wit because I do want to talk about Unibrew and their role as like Canada's first craft brewery uh, and how like fascinating and interesting they are and the Sleemans buyout and then Sleemans being bought out by Sapporo and them just kind of chugging along, making these really, really cool Belgian styles for all these years. And Bon de Chambly is their flagship that sold coast to coast. And I really quite like it and I do want to talk about it. Then we'll jump into Rodenbach Classic. Now, if you're of a certain age, my age apparently, um, you'll remember Rodenbach is only being sold in champagne bottles. 750 mil Cajun cork showpiece bottles that were, you know, 15, 20 dollars. They were so like special. That comes in like a can for four dollars, which I think is magic. Uh, I love Rodenbach. Uh, this is a Flemish red, which I have to think this is the only Flemish red we've ever had on the channel. Um, this is their entry level at 5.2%. They do make one that's aged more than this, which is kind of the what I would normally consider like the, the classic. This is the apparently now the classic. Um, but yeah, Flemish red sour, not a sour we've ever had before, but you know, we got to do these for 20 bucks and I needed a sour because we got to talk about Belgian sours and I, there was no way I was fitting a Lambic on that budget. Next up, uh, from establishment, as I spoiled earlier, we're gonna do St. Truden. Uh, so this is a Trappist style single. Now under the Trappist tradition, you would have the singles, which is what the brothers would drink kind of with every meal. Uh, you'd have the doubles, which would be sold to kind of, uh, at this point in history, abbeys were very much also hotels. So if you were traveling town to town, you couldn't really afford to stay at an inn, but you need to stay somewhere. You could stay in an abbey, sleep on some hay on the floor and you'd get fed and you probably wouldn't be robbed. So double is what you would be served as a guest of the Abbey, but not like a prestigious one. Triples were very often what they would serve as a seasonal beverage to farm laborers who were working on the Abbey's grounds, you know, harvesting wheat or whatever they were doing. Uh, and then quadruples or abd, uh, the highest alcohol, which we definitely can't fit in at $20 a four pack. Those would be reserved for uh, traveling, you know, high church clergy or nobility or, you know, very, very rich merchants. So we'll be doing a Belgian single, a Belgian double, a Flemish sour, and then finally a Belgian wit. Two from Canada, two actually from Belgium. Is it doing Belgium justice? No, but I couldn't do Belgium justice in nine beers. So we're going to do four and just dip our toe in those waters. We will be back to Belgium eventually. 
Now, for wine. Now, I know that we had a ton of chatter, just a ton of chatter last week about doing sherry. Now, for those of you who are here for the very start of the tasting, you may have remembered that part of the reason I'm a little bit behind the eight ball today is I forgot to order wine for a wine tasting. So we kind of scrambled around for the last half hour before we started this thing. And one of the things that kept coming up is what if we just did a best values in the store wine tasting? We could price it like 60 bucks. Well, that's what we did. Um, this is, and I didn't do it the cheaty way. The cheating way would be to say, hey, let's just do everything Spain. <laughs> Done. Uh, I limited myself. I only did one Spanish. And it's an amazing Spanish. This, this whole store, we could do just great Spanish values. Um, this, I think, is the best Spanish value in the store. But we're going to talk about some other things. We're going to talk about Gorgio Castoza. Uh, this continues my love affair with Garganiga, because, of course, there is Garganiga in here. Uh, for those of you who were here when we did the other Godus, we did do reds in these guys, but their uh, Rosé Malbec is absolutely amazing. And then in a ton, a ton, ton of Australian wines, everything now is over $20, and I don't understand why. <coughs> Heartland's over $20. Um, Wolf Blast is creeping. It's just, it's madness. Australian wine prices have gotten insane. I wanted to show that there are still some Aussie stuff under 20 bucks that's still very good. And more than that, it's not just 14.5% and it tastes like fruit and oak. There are still some well constructed, interesting sub 20 Australians. So, this is our upcoming wine tasting coming up on Friday next week. 23rd. The 23rd. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, can we do another Lambic? We will eventually get back to Lambic. Uh, oh, thank you, Chad, for answering Jim's questions while I was busy talking. Uh, and yes, it is super weird to see Roden back in Cannes now. Um... What's happening Saturday evening? I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, I do want to talk about what's coming up two Fridays from now. Obviously, we can't realistically do our traditional fall scotch tasting series. We just can't. So I talked with Devin basically on and off since, I don't know, April about doing something. And I wanted to do something that was going to be really interesting, something that would be worth everyone's time and be something that I would stand behind and be proud of. Now, how do I make it something that I can stand behind? I wanted to produce, introduce products that I really liked. I wanted to have conversations that would be worthy of you watching. Whether or not you actually have these products in front of you at home, this would be something that you would find interesting. So coming up two Fridays from now, the 30th, uh, we are gonna be hosting Andrew Lang of Old Malt Cask along with Lee Hansen, uh, of select wines in Calgary, all of us together are gonna be sampling these four whiskeys. We'll get to these in a second, but I do wanna stress this. If you have anything from Lang Family Bottlers, be it a Hepburn's Choice, or an Old Malt Cask, or a First Editions, or a Scarabus, or anything, we want you here. We want you to just come, hang out with us, watch us talk and be idiots and tell terrible jokes, watch us nerd out about whiskey and talking about the whiskey industry in general, and you can ask about the whiskey that's in front of you. It would be ideal if it was something they'd made, but if you had a lot of hard questions about Lagavulin, I'm sure they'd happily answer them. Um, the other thing I wanted to do about this is, okay, these four cans of beer are $20. Um, I'm discounting these pretty heavily. Uh, so if I was to ring these up off the shelf, you'd be looking at um, $534.64. I feel like that's not something we're going to sell a lot of as a tasting kit. So that's why I'm saying we're going to open it up. But I'm going to do one better than that. I'm going to sell these broadly at cost. So rather than $534.64, if you were to walk in tomorrow afternoon, let me get the pricing set up, uh, and say, I want to do all four whiskeys. A, thank you, you're an absolute saint. But B, I'm in charge of $412.84. So for the two weeks before the tasting, starting tomorrow afternoon, I'm gonna take these down to what they cost me. I'm not gonna make anything on this. 
well, we're going to make 3.5%, which is what our credit card rate is, because some of you are going to pay credit cards. And hey, if some of you pay cash or debit, I'll make something. Uh, but no, we are going to do these at actual cost. We're going to sell these to you for nothing because we want you there. We want you to be able to hang out. We're going to taste these four whiskeys together. You, me, Lee Hansen, Andrew Lang. We're all going to hang out and just drink some whiskey, talk about the state of the whiskey industry in 2020, challenges with COVID, where the industry is headed, challenges in independent bottler with distilleries that don't want to sell to independent bottlers anymore. Uh, and of course, we're also going to talk about their brand new distillery, Ardenho, which I bought a barrel of last year. So lots to explore, lots going on, super heavily discounted whiskey. It should be a really, really fun time. Uh, and then finally, Saturday evening uh, is the SAG Craft Beer Tasting. Uh, they are selling sets. Uh, we did pick the breweries. We picked Establishment, Cabin, 88, and Blindman. Uh, and there will be a kind of three hour event with little 15 minute mini tastings with guest speakers from most of those breweries, hosted by me. There'll be a DJ, it, and you also get a pizza. So. Uh, six beers is 60, nine beers is 90, and 12 beers is 120, uh, with all proceeds going back to the SAG. So that is what's happening this Saturday. Uh, Aaron will be running all the digital production and everything. It'll be, it'll be a fun night. I'm looking forward to it. So let's jump in on the Annex Ship Shape Munich Dunkel. Now, as I am given to understand, this is a collaboration with the Ship and Anchor Pub in Calgary. Uh, so this is a Munich, or pardon me, a Bavarian style dunkel. Do they call it Munich dunkel? Do you call it Munich dunkel? Why didn't I notice that before? Probably because I'm not very bright. Um, so I had done all the research on this, assuming it was going to be a Bavarian style dunkel. But this is a Munich style dunkel. Hmm. Uh, where do you buy the SAG tasting? You can get it through us here at the store or you can order it through the SAG. Uh, I just talked to Corey at Two Guys. I had been given to understand he was also uh, taking orders. He's not. It's us or the SAG. Uh, so you get a pizza and either six, nine, or 12 beers, uh, and then the tasting and DJ for the evening as part of your entertainment. So it's the digital version of the long running SAG Craft Beer Festival, which we've always been associated with, and I actually organized the first couple of years of myself. Now, I was assuming, I'll be very honest, that this was going to be more of a Bavarian style with lots of banana and clove and it'd be banana bread in a glass. But sometimes I make mistakes. Still German, still a dunkel. But this is so much lighter and prettier than I thought. I almost wonder if the Hefeweizen's bigger than this. This is soft and kind of root beer cola-y. Ooh, but that ale yeast. Um, if you ever want to get what I'm talking about, like ale versus lager, go from this dunkel, which is not, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of malting and hopping, all that different from the Hellas here. To go back and forth between the dunkel and the Hellas, you'll immediately get what I talk about when I say that ales have that much bigger yeast note. Like they're they're much more pronounced. I get something a little bit salty, buttery, kind of like salted toffee. I get almost something kind of popcorny, which I really like. And yeah, the esters on this, like it's got some really pretty top notes. Baked bread, brioche, caramel toast, a little bit of smoke, not a struck match kind of smoke, but like a, a little bit of campfire smokiness or something that's very pretty. Hmm. Thank you, McGinn. Uh, yes, it is very crushable for a darker beer. I agree, that is very pretty. Hmm. Now everybody feels that there's a huge time gap between what I'm filming versus seeing your comments. There is, there's about a 15 second time gap, uh, which is fun because I can quietly hear Aaron's screen kind of back in the background, which is me 10, 15 seconds ago, and it's very distracting, but we do have to have it on, so. Yeah, that is crushable. What's the alcohol? 5.5, five, I would guess? 4.9. Actually, that's lower than I thought. Jim's already, like, right in there. Yeah, finished the dunkel. It was great. I like Jim. Jim's good. He's right in on this. I like it. 
But yeah, so I'm always curious with Dunkles. Like, I feel like I should be better at picking beer sometimes. Like, I assumed that the, the Mellow Gold was not going to be a winner. It just blew up. Sometimes odd styles, sometimes odd things will just take off for us. Like, uh, talking to the guys at Establishment, they just can't believe how much part-time model we sell. And you talk to some of the other breweries around, it's like, you sell that much of that? We don't sell that much of that. Uh, we had that a little bit with um, Eric, with uh, Rosa Petsovitz. And it's like, yeah, you guys take like two-thirds, three-quarters of all of this rosé that comes to the province because you guys can sell it no one else can. How do you spell that? How, ooh, how do you... Ooh. How do you rank this week? Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, in a minute. One. Because that's just really great Weiss beer. Two. Three, four, and that's no slide on the annex. And yes, it is a nice change from sours and IPAs. That was a conscious thing on Devin. And actually, Devin really pushed on this, was like, enough sours and IPAs. Let's talk about other styles. That's why we're doing German week, and we've got Belgian week coming up next week. We are really trying to get away. Yes, there is a sour next week, but it's not an American style sour. We're trying to get away from the sour and IPA thing. That is a conscious decision. 4321. Wow. That's... Yeah, all right, I can get that. Two, three, one, four. Three, two, one, four. Can we give a shout out to Barry? It's his birthday today. Absolutely. 10% battery. Apparently, we're going to be on this for a short time left, Aaron. Uh, happy birthday, Barry. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the beers. I think it's going uh, to be a wonderful next year. It's certainly going to be better than 2020. Three, four, two, one, four, three, one, two, four, and two, three. There's really not a consensus, is there? Uh, I've seen, I think I've seen every single number except maybe one as somebody's top pick. Three, four, two, one, four, three, one, two. Yeah, I think we've seen every number except number one as somebody's top pick, and I think that's very, very well balanced. I like that. All right, I think Aaron, we could wrap her there, mostly because I know that my phone battery is dying by the second. Um, your dad picks one as first. Okay, we have one person who likes one first. Good. We have we have an absolute complete mishmash of everything. Yes, and two one four three. Ooh, so that would be the the uh, the Hellas, the Keller. Sorry, I should put these back in the order we actually tasted them. So that would be Hellas Keller. Munich Hefeweizen? Who just said that? Uh, Barry said that. Oh, okay. I'm one, two, four, three. You're one, two, four, three? I like the first one. You really like the first one? I totally respect that, yeah. Easy. What's my favorite Dunkel? Um, pass? Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just not my style. Uh, I... I personally find Dunkles kind of sweet without enough bitterness on them. They, they kind of, I mean, this much is enough Dunkel for me because they just, that sweetness builds and builds and builds and I ultimately need something to break it up. And Dunkles don't have a ton of bitterness. They don't have a ton of acidity. It's just sweetness and richness. And maybe if I was just having a massive pile of pierogies and sausages, which yes, please, obviously, um, Maybe I'd be really into just that much sweetness, but I don't know. It's the same issue I sometimes run into with barley wines. Like, I just can't do the sweetness. It's not my thing. Uh, Eric, you're going to struggle to learn more about Kellers. They are a really obscure style, and then they have an even more obscure style, which was called Zwickel. Um, historically, Keller beers were beers, they were kind of like um, tawny ports versus vintage ports. Keller beers were beers that were aged at the brewery for you and then released. Zwickel would very often be the same beer, but you'd be given it 
like very, very young and hoppy and fiery, and then you were supposed to age it in your own basement for like three to six months before you consumed it. Um, there's also a style called land beer, which is kind of related. Um, there's another one called like Zoigel that's in there as well. Like there's this whole like Franconian lager scene around Kellebier and Landbier and Zwickel and Zoigel. They're all interrelated and we could almost, you know, assuming I could get any of those latter three styles, we could almost have a tasting just on those. But yeah, Kellebier, at least for North America, has become a bit of a umbrella catch-all uh, classification. Oh, you're very welcome, Jim. That was fun. And yeah, I think we'll uh, I think we'll call her there. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Thanks everyone for joining us. This is a uh, this has been a fun little mini Oktoberfest where I didn't have to drink a liter of terrible Oktoberfest beer in a giant stein, which I'm prepared to call a win. Uh, so yeah, I think we'll leave off on that terrible slam against Oktoberfest beer that it probably doesn't deserve. And uh, yeah, for Andrew Hilton the apparently very judgmental Andrew Hilton tonight. Uh, I'm Kyle, and uh, yeah, thanks for joining us so much, folks. We'll see you again. <laughs>